I am a sucker for love stories. I'll admit it. The Notebook is one of my favorite movies, and I'll watch it over and over. It's it's rare that I watch a movie more than once, but that is an amazing movie. And rekindles are the best, and of course, because I have a rekindle, so I have my heart is with rekindles. Plus, my aunt had a rekindle. She kind of influenced me, I think, in some way. So today, I have Ken and Jen Hoffman as my special guests, and they have a great love story, and they also have a, a cancer story. So I'm not going to spill any details. I'll let them share their details. They both are on today, and they share a microphone, so we're some back and forth, but uh, it, we had a lot to talk about, and it's a long episode, but it was it's just a lovely story, and they are just so cute and a wonderful couple so I couldn't be happier for them that they found each other and that they're conquering cancer as well so here are Ken and Jen welcome to another episode of not your average lives and I actually have two lives on today that I'm excited to share with you I've only done one other episode with two people as guests and these two people are lovers and I am so excited to talk about love today and rekindle. It's something I'm very passionate about because of my history. My second husband was my college sweetheart, which I've shared on the podcast before. This couple are not really rekindles. I'll let them share the story, but they knew each other in high school and they connected on Facebook. And I think this is not uncommon that people connect on Facebook. Maybe they don't ever end up getting married, but Ken and Jen Hoffman are here, and I'm really excited to have them and let them share their story. So I'm going to go ahead and let them introduce themselves. And so maybe, Ken, you start and then turn it over to Jen. They're sharing a mic, so they'll be passing it back and forth. And then whoever wants, after you intro yourselves, just go ahead and start your story about how you reconnected. Okay, well, I'm Ken Hoffman. I'm 53. I'm with her. This is my wife, Jen. At the time we got back together, I was living in Walnut Creek, California, and Jen was in Buffalo. Uh, I lived in Buffalo up until I was 32. Yeah, 32. And then I met a woman online through a message board, and I moved to California to be with her. And we well, were that was the- early on because that wasn't, you said a message board. We didn't even have Facebook or any of those no, things. No, this was yet. pre-Facebook. This yeah. was on what year a- was that? 2000. Okay. And I moved out to California to be with her and we have a daughter together. And after six and a half years, we went our separate ra- ways, but I remained in California for another seven and a half years. And okay, she just whispered, don't tell the story yet. <laughs> so. Okay. That's I'll just okay. give to Jen. All right. A little bit more about me. I'm 33. I'm 53. I work at Verizon Media, which is the pair company of Yahoo. Uh, I am an incident manager there. I also play bass and I'm learning keyboards and I am in basses for a local band called the, called JB and the Center Street Band. Cool. What kind of music do they do? Do you guys play oldies? Two sets of classic rock, one set of country. Oh, cool. I love that. Hi, I'm Jen Hoffman, and I'm 52 years old, and I have been a lifelong resident of the Buffalo, New York area, so I have traveled but not moved and lived outside the the basic geographical area here. Um, I am currently a business owner. I own um, WNY Dyslexia Literacy Center. We specialize in uh, teaching people of all ages to read, write, and spell with confidence. And I also am a newly licensed real estate agent. Yes, and she's a prime example of somebody who just continues to thrive at uh, in her 50s, which I love, just getting licensed is exciting. And Ken was telling me in our pre-interview that he's going to get his license soon, and they're going to be a husband and wife duo out there selling and buying real estate. That's exciting. We are, but I'm going to let Ken tell start our story because he's a really good teller of the story. So, Yeah, I also want to say that when I posted on Facebook about I was looking for stories of Rekindle, 
Ken reached out. And I don't know if we're friends on Facebook, maybe from, cause we, we had, we, are. we were at the same conference about a year and a half ago and he was like the star of the conference. <laughs> so I won't, well, I don't know if we'll go into that, but anyways, yeah, he took action and he got an award for that, but it was really neat uh, because he reached out and shared the story with me. And a lot of times the woman does that. And I, I my husband, he's not even on social media, media, let alone sharing our love story with anybody. So I love that you're, you're kind of the leader in this. So go ahead, share. Go ahead. Okay. Well, it started back in 1984. Jen and I went to the same high school together. Uh, Iroquois Central and Elma, New York, just outside of Buffalo. We were in the same groups. We were in show choir together. We were in orchestra together. We were in plays together. We were in musicals together. We said no more than five words all throughout high school. We knew of each other, but didn't really communicate. She had her own subnet of friends within drama club and the musical and chorus. And I was just a wild child. I was just going all over the place. And she had another long-term relationship she was in throughout her high school years. After high school, I went from job to job, just basically floating around the Buffalo area. Jen got married at 23. Jen got married at 23 and was married for 20 years. And did you marry the guy that you dated in, in high school, In 2000, I moved out to California. No, actually, I met him during, um, over my summer work. I worked for Kayak Pools in Buffalo, New York for... Uh, four summers in a row, and he was in the MIS department, and I was in accounting, and um, yeah, we kind of, uh, I had broken up with my high school boyfriend, I had broken up with my college boyfriend, and uh, he was uh, boyfriend number, serious boyfriend number three, and I ended up marrying him. Long story short, it was basically a summer romance that lasted 20 years and probably shouldn't have, but we have four amazing kids together. So. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. he was in your destiny for sure. Cause you have your kids together. It's funny yeah. though. My, my husband, my first husband was my third serious boyfriend. It's crazy. Yep. So yep. I'm back and with the number two. Now. <laughs> so, uh, all right. Sadly, my number two passed away um, in December of last year, which was very sad he, of cancer. But um, my number one boyfriend and I are still friends. Um, and we talk fairly regularly. And when he doesn't live in the area, but when he comes back to town, I see him. And his niece is my goddaughter as well. So um, oh. I'm so I've been connected with the family for the last thirty some odd years. But um, Ken will tell the story of how we reconnected. All right, sorry that little segue. I was just I'm always curious about these relationships, how they intertwine. No problem. Yeah. No problem. So in 2012. At the about the mid of December, this girl posts a profile picture on Facebook. Let me backtrack. We had been Facebook friends for about four years before that. And she was always like giving thumbs up when I said I was going to quit smoking and stuff like that. But that was about the extent of our interaction on Facebook. Which is true. I think of a lot of people who are on Facebook, they have friends from high school. They probably one of the first things they do when, when we get on Facebook is we like, we're our high school friends and yeah, mm -hmm. reconnect, yeah. Well, she posted a profile picture that just enthralled me. I'm like, I have to know this woman when I saw that picture. So a little bit after so, the wait, first- So wait, wait, tip to all those people who have profile pictures of their grandchildren but are looking for a love of their life, update your profile picture, put some exactly. makeup on. <laughs> exactly, So. It was just the perfect picture of her. It captured her essence. It captured her spirit. It was fantastic. So a little bit after the first of the year, she posted on how sad she was sending her oldest child, her son, back to the Navy to continue his training. So I just took it upon myself to send a Facebook private message saying, hey, it's been 30 years since we've talked. How you doing? I saw how upset you were about sending your son back. If you ever want to talk, reach out to me. Because I need to tell a little backstory about the picture. I had been dating. Um, I had been on dating sites, Match, Plenty of Fish, I don't know, you name it. And 
I took that picture and in my mind, I was thinking, I'm going to put this picture up there and someone somewhere is going to say, I want to get to know that person. That was literally the thoughts in my mind. I, I just had, got chills all over my body. It, so it, you it, basically it, manifested. I him. did. Yes. Yeah. I for, for sure did. And um, well, I suppose we'll get into that uh, the next part that I was thinking a little later because it comes down the line. But um, I had gotten really, really tired of dating, of, you know, making a coffee be really to be stood up. You know, just stupid stuff, you know, probably from a guy that probably was still married, but didn't say, so. you know, just dumb, dumb stuff. Um, yeah, it makes you kind of lose faith in the human race when that stuff like that I, yeah, happens. A, a little bit. And I remember I, I was just, I came home from, from one of those meet and greets that didn't go. And I, I was thinking, you know, I'm kind of done with this. I'm going to go into the new year and I am just going to focus on me having fun with my friends, paying attention to my kids, my family, the things that were going on in my world. And I, you know, I didn't say forget dating men. I said, I really believed that the person that I was destined to be with was somewhere in my circle of friends that I, my thinking was, I haven't met this person yet. That it was going to be like a friend of a friend of a friend that I met at some social gathering and we connected and it was just going to go from there. I, I didn't expect where it came from, but. Um, and I want to interject here because, you know, I, have a program and I teach this and it's so profound what you're saying is you started to look for the things that you have and be grateful for them yes. and instead of looking for the thing that you didn't have and right. feel a lack about it and so it it's totally your your where your mind was and Absolutely. then the universe responded because you were grateful you were in that grateful space and you weren't in that I don't have what I need space and your energy that you put out also is this positive energy. And so I love that, that it just is so everything that you did was exactly the perfect way to do it. You know, I, I didn't necessarily, know, I mean, looking no. back, I know that you didn't know now yeah. mm -hmm. um, I had about three, four months before Ken sent me that message on Facebook. I had, um, I had been sort of seeing a guy kind of on and off, but we really weren't uh, in a relationship for for a couple of years, but he had lived in the area and then he moved out of the area and then he came back in the area middle of 2012 and, uh, you know, we kind of parted company in September kind of abruptly and I was having uh, a hard time kind of letting that go for a while. Um, so that was another driving force in my mindset of, you know, the kind of people that I wanted to be around. And I knew where my friends hung out and I knew what my friends were doing. And I, I guess I just, I wanted to spend time with the people that were in my life. So the day that my son went back to, um, it was the first time he had been home since um, going through basic training for the Navy. And when he went back, I planned my night afterwards because I knew that I needed to be supported. So I planned dinner with a girlfriend of mine and her husband. We went out to dinner. And then after that, I planned uh, to go out. Uh, a friend of mine, her boyfriend is in a band and we, I planned to go out with her, and that's exactly what I did. It was when I came home and put my phone on the charger that his message came in. Mm. And yeah. I thought, oh, that's so sweet, but 
I've had a long day and I'm tired and I'm just going to bed right now because I'm three. Yeah, it was midnight here and it was probably 9 p.m. when he sent the message. So I went to bed. I feel, are you getting emotional just re- reliving bit, yeah. it? Yeah, that's amazing. I um, love that. And I went to bed and I, I thought, oh, I'll just respond in the morning. And I did. And that set up, you know, we were just kind of, we would send messages back and forth, but not like immediately. Like it might be a few hours, it might be a half a day. And, you know, we'd respond to each other. So we yeah. were, we did start a conversation. That's neat. So the conversations are going back and forth. Mm-hmm. And I said, I want to talk to this girl on the phone. My favorite place in the world is Grizzly Peak. You can go there. It's in the Oakland Hills. You can go there and you can see the Bay Bridge, the Golden Gate Bridge, and downtown San Francisco with one eye closed. It's just a spectacular spot. So I went there. I called her. And I'm thinking, okay, 20 minutes would be a really good conversation. And we talked for an hour. That's I'm great. like, okay. I called her on Wednesday. And what was the reason for picking that location? Living situation. Okay. I was going to say good cell service. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was a living situation. I was renting a room from a guy who had to control every aspect of my life the moment I was in that place. Okay. Gotcha. So it was a little bit of freedom. Yeah. Good. On well, that's neat. That I love the, you know, the picture. I mean, if it's a lifetime movie, you know, that's a really good scene. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. On Wednesday, I went to call her, but she said, I'm feeling sick. I'll call you this weekend. I'm like, cool. Sure enough, she called me this weekend. And that, co- that conversation lasted two hours. And calls became more frequent, more texting. So the calls were just about life in general, catching up, things like just you couldn't, you just never felt a lack of being able yeah. to say something. We right? were always talking, whether it was about her kids, my life. Uh, we made admissions to each other. Like it was during those initial series of calls that I told her I was bipolar. Mm. And I'm thinking either she's going to be scared away or she's going to accept it. Mm. And she accepted it. Oh. And uh, she's telling me about her kids and stuff, past relationships with people that we both knew, things like that. And then it was the Saturday night before the Super Bowl in 2013. And I'm calling her and I said, you know, I have something to admit to you. I really, 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 really like you. That's how I said it. And she goes, I like you as well. I'm like, okay, cool. For the Super Bowl, it was San Francisco versus Baltimore. And that was the year that the power went out in New Orleans. And we're texting each other throughout the game. And she's calling plays before they were run. I'm thinking, wait a minute. This girl is extremely good looking. She's very smart. She's knowledgeable about a whole lot of things. And she knows football. Yay! I love those kind of girls. I'm that kind of girl too. My husband, I tell him he's really lucky because he's a good football guy. <laughs> so That's after great. the game, I said, you know, last night I lied. I don't like you. I love you. Oh. And this I heard, during the Super Bowl. This is after the Super Bowl. Oh, after the Super Bowl. Okay. I went in my car and I called her and I told her that. And okay. what did I hear on the other end? Dead silence. <laughs> and then all of a sudden I hear, I think I love you too. Oh, so we, it was at that point we started dating and then I'm thinking I need to get, I need to get back to Buffalo, not only to see family cause my family is still here, but I need to see her. So and, what's, the, what's the time frame here? Cause you had said fall and this was Super Bowl, Super I don't know, Super Bowl is like early February now. Started dating. January, end of January. We started talking early January, around the 5th and okay. February 3rd, we started dating. Okay. So pretty quick. Yeah. And then in the midst of the conversation, a couple of weeks afterwards, she told me that she's not looking for a forever boyfriend. Basically, 
I was, I'm of the mindset that I just didn't want to be a forever girlfriend. And I, I know. Oh, gotcha. Gotcha. I thought she was pushing back on the relationship, but oh, I see what she didn't want to like, isn't, first of all, let me ask you this, Jen, isn't it the worst thing to be a girlfriend after you've been married for 20 years? It's weird. I, I did not like that word. Did not. I was just, I was married for 25 years and then I go to be a girlfriend. I was like, that was weird. Yeah. I don't know if that bothered me so much, but I just knew that I did not want that level of a relationship. I, I didn't want, I mean, you know, people can say all they want about, well, you know, but we're committed and we're together. But until you sign the piece of paper, that's a commitment that's going to cost you a few grand to get out of. Yeah. Um, you know, just being a girlfriend, it might cost you a couple hundred dollars and stuff you leave behind, but it's not going to cost you everything. And, you know, so I just knew that I wanted to be married again. I had always known that I wanted to be married again. Another little prophetic thing, I guess. Basically, I had been married about three, two and a half years, three years or so. And our son was about six months old. And I was sitting on the couch having a conversation with my now ex-husband. And I looked at him and I said, if you don't pay attention to me, Someday, somewhere, I'm going to find someone who does. And that was, you know, 20, some 26, 25 and a half years ago. Mm. Um, and uh, I, I didn't know what that exactly would mean, but it actually happened. Mm. Um in one of our early uh, dating times, Ken called me needy and, and immediately regretted it. <laughs> I didn't regret it. I had to. I have to clarify that. Be- you used the word needy. I did use the word needy. Different connotation to me than it did. To right. Me. Yes. You had your lens on it, and he had his lens on it. So. Right. But there's enough. one thing with her. If I see something, I'm going to call her out on it. Mm. And she does the same with me. That's nice. And very so anyway, honest. Sounds like you have a very honest relationship. We do have a very honest relationship. So getting back, February third, we started dating. She tells me she wants to have a husband. On February 28th, I flew into Buffalo and asked her to marry me. Oh. So we were engaged three and a half weeks after dating. Wow. And then how long till you actually got married? Well, I was still living in California at the time. And I was struggling with employment and housing situation. Uh, It was extremely difficult leaving my then 10-year-old daughter behind in California. Oh, yeah. Well, moving away from her. Mm -hmm. I decided to move back to Buffalo and I drove cross country with everything in my car and my daughter came along with me on the trip. That was a very special moment for my daughter and I, and three, the hardest part I've ever had to go through in my life was putting her on a plane to go back to California, knowing we weren't going to have a daily interaction. So I did that. And that was in July of 2013. Jen and I were married June 14th of 2014. Wow, that's amazing. Congratulations. Okay, Thank so you. now we, you've been married. Now let me do the math. You've, how, it's, it's like set, six years you've been married now? Yeah, just a little bit over six years. Just a little over six years. Now I know Jen has faced a cancer battle, so I'd love to touch on that because I can't imagine just getting together and then getting this diagnosis. I remember one of the things my husband said when we got back together and he said, and I, I think we had just been together like a couple of years. Uh, we, I don't even think we were married yet. And he said, wouldn't it be terrible if one of us got sick? And I was like, that's a horrible thought. And then I thought, well, yeah, it does make you appreciate life, you know, the second time around. 
and it does make you want to really live in the present um, if you really think about how lucky we are to be here together. So can you just tell me kind of what, how you dealt with that? And good news is Jen is cancer free now uh, for yes. a little over a year, I think. Uh, yeah. I have been officially cancer free. I've had two clean scans, one in January and one in April. I go back for another one next month. Yeah. Yeah. So Scary stuff. I, um, Ken and I had been married four years it was in 2018 and you know things have been going along really swimmingly we had just graduated a year before the my children out of high school um my kids were doing their thing my son was still in the navy my oldest daughter was in nursing school uh, the younger two one was in college uh here in new york and the other was in the army so Ken filled your empty nest. He did. <laughs> yes, he did. He we flew started, right in. <laughs> we, we were only for about 10 hours, my son moved back home to be home here. And he lives here right now while he's going to college. So, um, but I discovered a lump under my tongue in uh, July of 2018 uh, I had it biopsied uh, at the end of August of 2018, and I'm actually coming up this week on my two-year uh, anniversary of diagnosis, but it was squamous cell carcinoma of the oral tongue, and it was, they staged it out at a stage three. Um, it had grown to a mass about four or five uh, centimeters across underneath my tongue. It Did you feel it in there? Oh, sure. Yeah. So you by knew the something time, was there. By yeah. the time I saw the uh, cancer surgeon, the cancer had traveled from my tongue into my lymph nodes in mm, my neck. Wow. Uh, so yeah, I know. I think squamous is fast growing. And my mom's had horrible. a couple removed. Yeah. Yeah. So I, uh, I used to work for a dermatologist. There, There's definitely skin squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, I was told, though I don't really know for sure, that the uh, tongue variety is a little different, but it's definitely rather aggressive. So we met with a cancer doctor first week of September. I had um, a third of my tongue and um, 49 lymph nodes removed from my neck on September 28th. Wow. How many lymph nodes do we have? I don't we even know. Hundreds, that's a, hundreds, 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 because okay. I've had more removed since. And um, of all those that were removed, only that one that we knew was cancerous was removed. And, you know, I went into it thinking, oh, I just have to have surgery. And then after going through surgery, I'm now faced with oh, no, but you really need radiation as well. And then I was like, oh, my goodness, radiation can do all this damage. It can kill my thyroid. It can make my teeth fall out. It can do all these horrible things. But if I don't have it, what will happen then? So we, I went through radiation. Uh, they just radiated my oral tongue area. So from about my jaw up through like right under my nose and i finished that right after christmas it's a super horrible experience that i wouldn't wish on anybody mm. by the time i was done with that treatment i was basically eating smoothies potato soup that i put through a blender water and hot tea yeah, I know somebody who had throat cancer and it like they did radiation and it like it basically burns everything, right? It does. Yeah. So I went into 2019 thinking I had put all that nonsense behind me. Ken and I went on the trip to California. That's where B when BBD was the conference happened. Yeah, the conference where I met you guys. Yep. Yeah. And uh I I was ready to rock and roll with life. I thought, oh, good, that thing's behind me. We're moving on. And then I had my first post-treatment scan in March, 
went in thinking I'm golden. He's going to say you're cancer free. Congratulations. I went in by myself. Ken was working third shift at the time. And or were you? Yeah. And he said, we found another mass. And I felt like someone had taken my big bubble and balloon and put a big pin in it. And I was totally deflated after that. And I, I, yeah, I, let me just I give a little background because, remember. you know, we met at a, a business conference for online business owners right. and it, Ken came to support Jen and Jen was all excited about an online business that she was going to be launching. I don't know if you had already launched it or not or where no, you were. We were, we were going to be teaching um, teachers about dyslexia. That was okay. what we were going to do. Yeah. So, so Ken comes as a spouse to support his wife and he gets an idea. He gets a business idea during there. And that's what he won the prize for is because he stood up and said, you know, I've been sitting here in the audience and this is really inspiring. And I, I play the, the bass and I'm really excited about that and teaching other people. And I think I'm going to make an online business out of it. And of course you guys went home and the, the life kind of threw a monkey wrench at you. I remember you posting in the group and saying that Jen had got, had a, uh, about that you were fighting the fight. So I know everything went on hold, but I just wanted to give a little backstory there. And uh, so go ahead. I was just going to say regarding my online business, uh, I'm a good acquaintance of the bassist Billy Sheehan. He was the bassist for David Lee Roth when David Lee Roth left Van Halen. And I had this idea for a business, and part of the online platform was to interview a really famous bassist to give encouragement to those just starting out. So I just said, I haven't talked to Billy in 18 years. I'm going to see if he might be interested in something like this. Yeah, because you got this wife from just reaching out. What, what's this? You could have a whole online business from reaching out. You never know what these old connections will do for you. Exactly. So I sent him a Facebook message, and he replied three hours later saying, I'd love to do it. That's great. Yeah. So going back yeah. to Jen's story. So Yeah. There's so many different stories intermingled with your love story. You know, business, oh, for online sure. business story, cancer story. It's like we could yeah, talk for so They yeah. told me. Oh, we'll just go in there. We'll take it out. It'll be fine. Um, so this was on a Wednesday and the doctor looked at me and I'm like, so when do you want to do the surgery? He goes, I have an opening Friday. And I went, uh, oh, uh, uh, okay. <laughs> um, so we had this, I had the surgery on Friday. I spent one night in the hospital all was well, I was healing well. And then 10 days later, I started to feel a, a hot lump in my neck. And I thought it might have been an infection. I called the hospital. It's a cancer hospital, so they don't really have an ER. But they, you know, the PA got back to me and said, you know, warm compresses, all these things. And I, I did that and I was taking copious amounts of ibuprofen. And I kind of just dealt with it. And we went to, uh, within the next couple of days, we drove down to Kentucky to see my daughter, who's in the army. We stayed there. I was still taking copious amounts of ibuprofen. We came back home. It was Easter and Easter rolled into my birthday, uh, which is at the beginning of May. And we went out for dinner and my daughter, who's the nurse, looked at my neck and said, Mom, your neck is so red and lumpy. And I said, I know, maybe it's infected. And I said, I, I just sent a picture over. Was that to, where the surgery was? It was. Okay. It was all in the same area. And the next day after we had been out to dinner for my birthday, um, that area started oozing and and leaking sub fluid and so i called up the hospital and i said i need to get in to see somebody and they took me in the next day and i spent the whole day there by myself because again ken was working third shift so he was sleeping during the day 
I was set to start my next round of radiation treatment on my neck on that Friday. I was going in for my dry run, and that's when they discovered that cancer had returned. Just 10 days after your surgery. Yes. Gosh. Um, so at that point, I was very concerned about the whole situation. They were going to send this whole situation to the tumor board, which most cancer hospitals do. And on that Wednesday, following the, the diagnosis of a return of cancer, my surgeon called me back and said, well, this is the plan. Um, it's very invasive. It could be affecting the carotid artery. We want you to have a balloon occlusion to see if you can live without a carotid artery. And I went, whoa. I got that call and my assistant uh, director of my business happened to be sitting in my house next to me and she basically held my hand through the whole call. And that's when we stood up and said, there must be another option than this, you know, 12 to 15 hour surgery that we they want to do on me. So... So we took it upon ourselves saying we fired the cancer hospital when they said we want to remove the carotid artery, we want to take a muscle from your thigh and put it in your neck, so on and so forth. So my first thought was Sloan Kettering in New York City because of the reputation. We went down there. Uh, we were seen by a physician in Sloan Kettering. At the same time, we found out that Erie County Medical Center, which is the largest hospital in the Buffalo area, has a head and neck cancer department. And it's led by the former head and neck cancer department from the cancer hospital Jen was going to. He broke away from that cancer hospital and started his own head and neck cancer clinic. We met with him and ECMC and Sloan Kettering had the exact same treatment option same exact same procedures so we decided to stay locally and what they did is they did three rounds of chemotherapy to shrink the tumor the tumor was the tumor extended from her adam's apple to her ear the third mm. time around and it was too big for surgery so ecmc and sloan kettering said they were going to do chemotherapy first to shrink the tumor followed by surgery followed by radiation. So starting in June, Jen started chemotherapy. It ended around the third week of July. It definitely shrunk the tumor. She lost her hair and a ton of weight. And on April, August 6th, she had a five-hour, five 45-minute surgery. They removed the tumor. No, their carotid artery is still there. And what they did is they actually cut her chest open and flipped a pectoral muscle into her neck, keeping the blood vessels and nerves intact. And they took a skin graft from her thigh to cover the area because the skin was killed from the cancer. Mm. Well, wow. And what I think this is going to help people with, Jen uh, and Ken, because you're uh, having, being a spouse and any loved one go through this must be horrible and heart-wrenching, but uh, anybody who is going through a diagnosis right now, options. I mean, yes, that's the big lesson. Sure. That's a big lesson from here is like doctors. It's like, you you know, go, get a second opinion, get a third opinion. I'm so happy that you did that. And we did the same thing when it came to um, what to do about radiation because following the surgery, I had to have radiation again yeah this time they did it on my neck because they did not do my neck the first time around so basically um i have had uh, a ton of chemo poured into my body i've had 66 rounds of radiation the second round of radiation left me unable to eat i didn't eat for like five days they had to put in a feeding tube I had the feeding tube until May of this year when they took it out. I was formula fed for most of that time. I had to go through swallow um, therapy to learn how to swallow again. Mm. Um, and then 
I, my throat wasn't opening up enough to eat real food. So on June 9th this year, year, I had another surgery to dilate my esophagus. And at the same time, they removed my chemotherapy port from my chest. And um, that was that was the last time I had surgery. But certainly it it wasn't a one and done thing like I had hoped for from the beginning. And really it's a different perspective being the patient because you're just so consumed with what you're feeling and what you're going through. And the spouse is in a totally different position because I mean, he just, he, he was there through every chemo treatment. He was there through every radiation treatment he was there for, you know, six hours of surgery the first time and two hours of surgery the second time and six hours of surgery the third time. And by November, when I was recovering, he was, he had had it. He was mentally just spent. And I know my work performance suffered from it. And, uh, we, we just keep plugging along. That's all you can do is you live one day at a time and you just keep plugging along. And although she's done with the surgeries, although she's done with the radiation and chemo, we're still feeling the effects from it. Yeah, yeah. I, I, when I, you reach out to me when I posted about wanting to have a story of Rekindle, I was actually worried about how Jen was. I was worried about what you were going to say and I was so excited to hear that she's clean and I am so sorry she's had to go through so, so much. And, you know, when you guys just found each other not too long ago. So I want to wrap up. It's been great with you guys sharing your story. I appreciate it so much. But what I would like for each of, from, from each of you as we close out is what would you tell the 2000 or the pre pre for Ken, what would you tell the pre gen version of Ken? And for Jen, what would you tell the pre Ken version of Jen? Always keep your options open and never stop looking. Because if you set your sights on something that you know isn't going to work, you're not going to be truly happy. So always keep your options open. Always keep searching uh i'll close my portion with this my favorite band is rush and in 2000 getty leaf released a solo album and in the song working at perfect is the line when it's right it's right as rain when it's right there is no pain when it's right it's not again oh so. I love that. I don't know if I put that follow quote that. In the notes. <laughs> the quotes in the show notes. I love it when lyrics resonate so much to life. Such thanks for that share. That was amazing. Um, what would I tell myself? I would tell myself that um, just because you feel like you made a mistake, you can't. You certainly can start again. You know, I divorced in my early 40s. I, it was a good time um, because I, was, I felt like I was still young enough, if, if that was a thing, to find the person that I was really looking for. Um, but you're never, you're, you're never too old. My grandfather remarried when he was living in a nursing home before he passed away and he was in his 80s. So, you know, I, it's always it's always out there and it's always available to you. And my heart knew what I was looking for. My heart always knew what it was looking for. And I knew that I was given the desires of my heart when Ken and I got together. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, I think so much of the time we do what our brain, our logic brain tells us, we just listen to that and we ignore what our heart says. And that's just a pure example of that you went with your heart in this case. 
And I believe in soulmates. I believe that we, we don't have just one soulmate, but you clearly, no. you two are clearly soulmates and we're meant to be together just later in life. You know, it just didn't happen earlier. Yeah, We and bumped it, it into works. each other, but for some reason. <laughs> and it works out. We just love doing things together. We love traveling. We love, love we just love doing things together. And I think in, in our age range, finding that companion, I think that's a really good word for it. Mm -hmm. um, Ken and I are life companions. Yeah, and chat. You like to chat. I mean, I, that's what I get from you guys because you had long conversations. And that's what I love about my husband. We never get tired of talking. No. And never. just are so interested and laugh a lot. Ken, I feel like Ken has like the sparkle in his eye. He's, he's, he's probably pretty funny, huh? Well, I get tired because I'm old. So, you know. What do you get tired? You just sit on the couch? What, what is tired? What do, you, what do you do? I go out on the porch. I sit in the chair. I have a drink. And I listen to James Brown. Yeah, that's good. That's good music. Mm -hmm. I'll see you far and I'll see you rain. Is that good? <laughs> no, that's James Taylor. James Brown. Oh, James Brown. Okay. James, James Brown Sorry. is like, I feel good and uh, I feel let's good. Get funky, yeah. you know, stuff like that. So Yeah, I know James Brown. And okay. It's a rush because Sorry. I can never give a brush, but, you yeah, know. Yeah. I got him hooked on country music, so. Oh, yeah. No, it did not get me hooked on country music. I hooked myself on country music. What happened was, is there was a band, there was a country band looking for a bass player. I had, I swore off country music. That's all I listened to growing up. And I'm like, I'm never listening country. Country is horrible. Country is of the devil, blah, 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 blah. And I started playing country music. I'm like, you know what? This stuff is really good. So now mostly I'm lis I listen to country a large amount of the time. And we're, when we're in the car together, all we listen to is country. Mm. Yeah, I my kids got me at, when Shania Twain was big. Yeah, they got me into that. Like, you know, that's an easy country. It's like a poppy country. You know. Yeah. But yeah. Country has good, good, good lyrics. Really good. Well, lyrics. my husband grew up on you know Johnny Cash. And yes, I list my my dad played those albums. Yeah. Yeah. Knew all the yeah. words to the Johnny Cash songs. Yeah. So yeah. I think that's why he. Uh, and Glenn, what was Glenn? What was Glenn Campbell. Yeah. Let's walk down memory lane here. There's yeah. a Loretta picture. Lynn. Of, there is a picture of my dad sitting on Dolly Parton's lap. Oh, I so. love Dolly. Dolly. Yep. Coat of many colors is one, like one of my favorite songs that she does. So, all right. Well, this was really fun. We could have another episode about songs. Just talking yeah. about this, our or, favorite songs from the yeah. 80s. <laughs> music anything like that yeah. but i want to no. come see ken play i'll have to drive up to buffalo i'm in virginia so it's it's drivable i i do have a story i was in buffalo once for business oh really yes i had to go for a business some business thing and i back then we didn't have our phones to look up the weather right and it was i don't even remember what time of year it was but it was the time of year that it can snow and i get up there I have no boots, no nothing. I just have high heels and it, it snows like a foot. And then I was sick and I had a sore throat. And I, right before I left, it was one of those business meetings I couldn't get out of. I had gone to the doctor to get a strep throat test. So I got the call from my doctor when I was in the hotel <laughs> that I had strep throat. That it was positive. Okay. And I had to go in my high heels to the CVS or whatever equivalent it was. That was outside in the snow in my high heels and i that's that's my memory of buffalo <laughs> well i'm going to tell you that it's august and it's absolutely gorgeous i now bet outside I bet. but um yeah virginia is not not that far away but can't right now with covid um we're kind of stuck here in new york yeah There's but aren't you glad you're stuck with ken <laughs> could you imagine i'm so that's what i you know it, you find out if you don't like your spouse in this in a pandemic, right? Yeah, I mean, it, I'll tell you, we had we have two college students here, and Ken and I, and there were times that it got a little tense. But um, the college student that goes away to college, we I took back on Saturday, so yeah, it's hard for them. They very happy. Their freedom, it's, it's, yeah, their friends and all that. Well, yeah. anyways, thanks so much. Thanks, Ken, for 
you know, volunteering to come on and talk about your, your love story. And thanks, Jen, for sharing so much about your cancer journey. Our pleasure. All Thank right. you very much for having us. All right. Thank you so much for tuning into the Not Your Average Lives podcast. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe on iTunes if you have an Apple device. You can find free resources and learn what else I have going on at the moment that might interest you on my website at notyouraveragegrandma.com. You can also find me on Instagram or Facebook at Not Your Average Grandma. If you liked this episode, it would make my heart so happy if you could leave me a five-star rating. You can also add a review to let me know what you like about this podcast, which will help spread the word about it to others who need a little midlife inspiration. As always, be you, listen to your inner voice, and focus on reigniting that lost spark so you can start living your own, not your average life. Mm-hmm.